You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Chester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. Emily, if you've not met me before, great to be here. I'm loving here. I was here a few weeks ago, and the sun's here again, so I think I should come here more often um, and enjoy the Chester sunshine. Brilliant. Well, if you have not been here last week, we have just started our series on family. So we are week two on family, and Pastor Lee preached an amazing message last week looking at God's idea of family, talking about the fact that family is what God does, family is who uh, family is who God is and family is what God wants us to experience. He talked about that family takes work, but family agrees, it lifts us, uh, others up and family stands together, which is brilliant. Um, and I guess I'm going to start with a verse I want to read to you now that we're going to come back to. And I want you to... Um, Go with me for the message today, okay? I believe that God's going to do something powerful. been praying for you guys this week. And so we're starting here at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. And it says this, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and broken. We are perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do. But we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. The title of the message this morning is Pressed But Not Broken. Pressed But Not Broken. So last week we heard about uh, God's idea of family and how incredible it is and how wonderful and how beautiful it is. And I guess really we kind of get this image that it's almost like when family works, it's like poetry in motion. It's just beautiful, it's great. It is the Instagram shot that you see in social media. But I know that family doesn't always look like that. And there's probably many of you sat here thinking, yeah, that's definitely not what I've experienced. It's definitely not what our family looks like. And I think when family doesn't work, it can be the most painful thing. And rather than um, reflecting poetry in motion, it's pretty much like a train wreck. And I think that um, many of us, we can all relate to that in some ways. We all have our own upbringing, our own experience. We, you know, we've been through different things. When I think about um, my family when I was growing up, my childhood, I was totally blessed with an amazing uh, family with great parents. I've got happy memories, fun things. I look back and think that was brilliant. Um, my parents love me and my siblings. I'm the eldest. Um, and, you know, they love me, but more importantly, they love God. And I just think, wow, what an incredible, blessed family I had. But as I guess I've kind of got a little bit older and I've journeyed more of life, I've had more of life's experiences, I definitely have experienced some more train wreck kind of scenarios. You know, we've, I've personally walked through what it is to feel loss and grief. We've walked through that. There's been times in our lives, whether um, it's with close family friends or just people that we're close to, where we experience, I guess, elements of betrayal and rejection. I know what it feels like to uh, have relationships that have been broken and there's been disunity. I know what that feels like. But I also know what it feels like to uh, have Psalm 18 where it says that he reached down from on high and he stooped down and he picked me up and lifted me up. I know what it feels like to feel the love and comfort of God. I know what it feels like to feel restored, renewed and healed. See, I know that and I'm believing that for every one of us in this place today that we're going to experience some of that. Now you may be thinking, Emily, gosh, we're only week two. Family, week two, we had all the good stuff last week, and it feels like, whoa, we're getting into this pretty quick. But I want to say, if we didn't talk about this up front, it's almost like having an elephant in the room, because we could go through the whole series saying how amazing family is, and God wants us in family, and God designed family, and that's all great. And we sit here thinking, but there's an elephant in the room, because my family often resembles the train wreck. So we're going to journey this through together, and I'm believing that for Um, you today that you're going to maybe for some of you even just recognize elements of things that have gone on in family history back in family lines or maybe it's recent maybe it's well in the past but actually still have an effect and an impact on you today 
We're also going to look at how we can be free from that. And I want us to move forward in this series as we look at family with a different filter, making sure that we have the right filter. See, in family life, we've all been pressed. We've all been challenged. We've all experienced difficulty and strife and um, various different things. And we've had that pain. And we may feel like we're broken. But I want to say that we don't have to live with brokenness, that we don't have to live. We may be pressed, but we don't have to live with brokenness and be broken. And I guess the way we're going to do that this morning is we're going to read a story, okay? Because everyone loves a good story. However, I have to tell you that this is no Disney story, okay? There's not going to be no fuzzy feelings. It's not going to be, you know, this is not a Disney story. In fact, it's a total tragedy, okay? And just as a little heads up and a spoiler, it doesn't even have a happy ending. Who's glad they came to church today? <laughs> the doors are locked. You cannot escape. Okay, but you've got to trust, trust God that he knows what he's doing, okay? Okay, so we're going to look at a story in Judges, Judges 11. And I'm going to be picking things from this. And maybe afterwards you can go away and read more of it in your own time. But Judges 11, it says this from verse 1. Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. The first thing I want to highlight from this is the fact that you didn't get to choose when or what you were born into. Okay? You didn't get to choose when you were born. You didn't get to choose whether you were born in the medieval times or the Victorian times, or maybe in the middle of a world war, or a recession, or even in a pandemic, Melody Grace. You didn't get to choose when. Um, I'm personally just glad that God knew, you know, knew who was doing with me when he made sure that I was arrived in the world when they had invented central heating. Because as most of you know, I don't like being cold. So praise the Lord that I'm here, because medieval times, it would have not been good. But we don't get to choose when we were born. We don't get to choose what family we're born into, whether your family was rich or poor, whether your family was educated or not, whether your family uh, was born, you were born here in the UK or in a country across the other side of the world. You didn't get to choose that. You didn't get to choose whether your family um, had a whole history of divorce and brokenness. You didn't get to choose whether your family was riddled with health issues. You didn't get to choose whether your family um, had people in it that had cycles of um, abusive and bad habits. You didn't get to choose when and what you were born into. And I want to say that um, when you read the story, it's, a, it's the semicolon that points to the issue, okay? Because it says here, his father was Gilead. Everything was good. His father was Gilead. Semicolon. However, his mother was a prostitute. It all went wrong at the semicolon for this guy. And I want to say, we all have a semicolon in our lives. My family was going great, but then my dad left when I was young. My family, life was really good, everything was great, but then my mum got sick. My family life was great, but then we encountered death. My family life was great, everything was good, but then we had mental health issues come along. My family life was great, but then this person walked out on me. My family life was great. My family life was great. Semicolon, and then it all went wrong. We've all got a semicolon. We can all point to an experience or a moment or a time, something where you think that is where everything would be okay if it wasn't for this. And I want to say that for most part, a lot of it, it's not our fault. We didn't get to choose when or what we were born into. It was out of our circle of control. But I want to say what is in our circle of control is how we choose to respond to it. See, either we can be, um, live our lives as victims to our upbringing, victims to our experience, victims to the semicolon, or we can choose um, to actually take what it is and actually let God in on it. And actually, instead of letting our past dictate our future, we can take God and counter God and let actually a new future be written. Back to Jephthah. So his brothers have kicked him out. They're like, you don't belong here. You can't be part of this family. You know, you've been rejected. Off you go. You're not worthy. Verse number three. 
So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob. Good name. I can pronounce it for a start. That's helpful in this account. Um, so he's in the land of Tob, where a gang, gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Jephthah fled. I reckon there's a lot of people in here who can resonate with this guy that family life has kicked off. There's fireworks. It's all going off. It's challenging. It's difficult. It's awkward. And what do we want to do when we're in that scenario? We want to run. We're like, get me out of here. I don't want to have to deal with it. I don't want to have to work through it. Just get me out. And he has run. Anybody else recognize? I'm like, yeah, I'll get me out of here. What happens is, is when we um, experience brokenness, when we experience you know, challenge and strife, what can happen is that the fight or flight kicks in and our survival instinct is heightened. When we live with brokenness, we live lives where our survival instinct is heightened. See, when we've experienced um, elements of betrayal or rejection, Maybe we've been lied to. Maybe we've been cheated, deceived. Maybe there's just some fracture in our relationships. What happens is that in that moment, trust is broken. And then whether we know it, whether we recognize it, whether we do it consciously or subconsciously, we make a choice to trust no one. Trust no one. Which means that we go through life and in terms of our relationships in family or maybe at church or maybe with your close friends at at work, what happens is is that our relationships are hard work because um, every time people want to get close to us, if we have the the flight um, survival instinct, every time people get close or every time there's even a hint that we could be rejected or, you know, put out, we get out of there, we run. So we spend our life going from relationship to relationship, never really making commitment, never really putting our roots down anywhere because we're just like, get me out of that. And it's a lonely existence. The other survival instinct that may kick in is that we want to fight, which I want to say is just an equally lonely, isolating existence because although we don't run, we stay where we are, but we put every barrier up. We build every wall up. We're like, no one is getting in here because it's a survival instinct that says, I've been hurt and broken and, and um, you know, betrayed before. I'm not going to let that happen again. So we put things around us to try and protect ourselves. And no one can get in. No one gets to know the real us. No one can step in and help us. No one can kind of speak to the greatness that's within us. And we put our walls and we put our barriers up. Our hearts become hard. And it's in order to protect ourselves. Our survival instinct kicks in. The second part of this verse, it says that he's, ra- he's fled, and then it says, and he uh, settles where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. So in the story, it doesn't say, you know, what his brothers were like. It, it kind of says that as they grew up, they pushed him out, basically. So I would imagine that over time, you know, they probably called him names. That it's the kind of thing where, you know, you're all at the table and they kind of huddle around making sure that Jephthah can't fit in. Oh, there's no room here. So he's kind of pushed away. I reckon he probably experienced some kind of emotional abuse from them, maybe physical and maybe verbal, just saying that you're no good, that you're not part of the family. So let's just say they were not kind. They were not good. And what does he do? He doesn't then go and find a nice, inviting family who are open, who are loving, who are showing him kindness. No, he ends up being with a gang of scoundrels, which is just like people no good for him, not going to pick him up, not going to speak to the greatness within him. And I want to say that when we live with brokenness, our brokenness can actually become attractive. The power of familiarity kicks in. See, the more you're exposed to something, the more attractive it becomes. And it seems crazy. And if you talked about it in the natural, it would seem crazy. But it's like, even though what we can experience is bad for us, it's harmful for us, it gives us pain, and we, you know, it's not, we know it's not good. There's something about the familiarity that makes us feel safe. We can go around with bad habits, wrong thinking, um, unhealthy relationships, and even though we may know that it's not good for us, we don't know what life would be like without it. What would my life look like without, without these mental health issues? What would my life look like without outside of this relationship? I know it's bad for me, but I can't help it. It's kind of attractive, and it keeps me safe, and I feel okay here. 
and we become um, these people that just live with our brokenness because we can't see the other side of what freedom could bring. I think often we live, when we live broken, with open wounds that just bleed brokenness. And almost then the other people around us who also are attracted to brokenness, and this is kind of what's happened to our guy, Jephthah, that he's just attracted other people who are not good, who are broken. Our brokenness can become attractive. Back to the story. It says here in verse 4, Sometime later, when an enemy, the Ammonites, were, they were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me out from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The leaders of Gilead said to him, nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us, fight the Ammonites, and you will be be head over all who live in Gilead. And I say that if we don't deal with our brokenness, the seeds of brokenness grow into choking thorns of insecurity. We don't deal with it. See, when our identity is being damaged, when it's been attacked, when our uh, self-worth and our value has been taken away from us, if we don't deal with it, what happens is we live a life of um, having insecurity and it chokes us. It stops us from taking God opportunity because we're too insecure. It stops us from making good decisions because we come so insecure. See, for Jephthah, the unresolved, in, the unresolved injustice was awoken within him. He says, hang on a minute. You hated me. You kicked me out and now you want me? And something within him rose in him and thought, yeah, there's been some injustice and I was wronged. And do you know what? I need to put this right. And every insecurity, you can imagine in that moment that he felt all the, um, the hurt, the betrayal, the rejection, what he's being robbed of, the fact that he couldn't have a family life because they kicked him out. All this emotion has kind of come to the surface, has been reawoken. And there's an injustice and it needs solving. And he's like, he's so insecure now. He's not dealt, he's so insecure that he then goes to make bad decisions. I want to say that at the beginning of the story, the first line of, that we read in Judges, it says that he was a mighty warrior. See, there was seeds of greatness within him. In fact, that's why the guys have come back, because they're like, hang on, he was a mighty warrior. We're going to go back and we'll use that. And there was seeds of greatness within him. I want to say there's seeds of greatness within every single one of you. But if we allow our brokenness to take hold and we don't deal with it, then we're going to spend our lives choked with insecurity. Then Jephthah, he makes decisions, takes opportunity out of insecurity. Jump to the end, towards the end of the chapter, it says this. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give me the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went out to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. Now, I say, him fighting had nothing to do with giving glory to God. It had everything to do with him trying to fight an injustice that had happened, to him trying to put right a wrong. See, I reckon people, we can spend so much of our lives trying to fight an injustice or trying to put right a wrong that's taken place. We try and spend our lives doing, going to great lengths, climbing over people, causing absolute destruction wherever we go in terms of our relationships, either for us or for other people, when we strive to fill our insecurity with the wrong things. His identity is in tatters, yes, but he's trying to fill it by trying to prove himself, trying to put right the injustice, trying to prove that, you know, that he is this person and not have his identity in God. And I really find that when we do that, when we try and put, you know, find our insecurity in other stuff, does it rarely yield the return we want, which is peace. See, for Jephthah, he got his, he got his, just, he got his justice. But at what cost? Verse 34, when Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter? Dancing to the sound of timbrels, she was an only child. 
except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. She went off into the hills to cry with her friends, realizing that she would never marry because of what her father was about to do. And the last verse says, after two months, she returned to her father and he did to her as he had vowed. When we don't choose to deal with our brokenness, the cost is paid by the next generation and our future destiny. See, Jephthah, he'd had his moment, I guess, in the limelight. He had his moment where he's like, yes, I've got justice. But who paid for it was his daughter. Who paid for it was his future destiny because the Bible says that it was his only daughter. So he's just cut off his uh, opportunity to, you know, for his family line to continue. So his destiny, in effect, stopped there. And I want to say if we don't deal with the brokenness and the hurt and the pain and allow God to do what he can do, what happens is we pass it on to the next generation. The quote here by Richard Raw says this, that pain that is not transformed is transferred. I have to deal with my brokenness. I have to deal with the things that have caused me hurt and pain because if I don't, I'm going to pass them on to my daughter, Jasmine. I'm going to pass them on to my son, Zach, and Ezekiel. I have to deal with it so that they don't have to live, um, I guess, their lives in brokenness, but they can live in wholeness, in freedom. They can live the life that God's called them to do. I'm so glad that we know a God who is into transformation. I'm going to finish where we started in 2 Corinthians. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and broken. We are perplexed because we don't know why things happen. But we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. Verse 14 says, we know that the same God who brought the Lord Jesus back from death will also bring us back to life again. Do you know, church, I know that no family is perfect. Be that your biological family, our church family, you know, the people you call family. I know that it's not perfect because we're people and we are an imperfect people covered by the grace of God. But we have to deal with our brokenness. And there are two things that we need to do that are going to start that journey. Two actions to be done, one by us, one by God, but both require something of us. The first action that we have to do is we have to choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. Church, this from us requires courage, a great deal of courage. Maybe for some of us in this place, we need to choose to forgive people in our family, maybe people in, you know, your friends that you call family. For some of you, maybe it's yourself that you need to forgive. Colossians 3.13 says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. When we withhold forgiveness, we're basically almost expecting for, um, you know, it's like us, drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. Unforgiveness that we hold, it just damages us. It has detrimental effects on us and the way we do life, the way we see life, the way we see others, the filter that we put on when we hold forgiveness. I want to say as well, let's let God be judge. He is just. He is the judge. Luke 6, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. See, forgiveness is not freeing the other person from the act. It's freeing yourself from the effect of it. And today I'm believing that's going to happen in a moment when we make a choice to forgive. And let me tell you, for some of us, it is going to be a daily choice to continue. I forgive, I forgive, I forgive until you feel something different happen on the inside and you feel that sense of freedom, that release. Because we don't want our past to dictate our future, church. We want to rewrite the future. 
for the sake of us and the next generation. So what do you need to do? Maybe some of you need to call somebody. Maybe have coffee. Hey, you can invite them into your homes now from tomorrow. Have that conversation. What is it you need to do? Who is it you need to forgive? Takes courage. Second thing is this, is this is God's action and it's restoration. We have to let God restore. And from us, this requires faith. And I'm not saying that your family situation is necessarily going to change. But some things, maybe they literally cannot change. It's not about that. It's about us being changed. It's about us being healed, restored, renewed, so that we can have a different outlook, a different filter. For so many of us, what we want to, God to do is just remove it. I don't even want there to be a semicolon, God. I just want it to be removed completely. But I want to say that God's not into removal. He's into redemption. He's into restoring. I want to show you a picture of some art. A, it's a bowl, but it's still art. Kintsuki. It's a Japanese art form. And this art form, it teaches us that broken objects are not something to hide, but to display with pride. You see, this, this bowl here, what it was, it was once broken, but it's been put back together. And instead of trying to cover up the cracks, instead of trying to cover up the brokenness in shame or trying to hide it, it's actually magnified. It's actually been refined. It's actually got gold running through it. And actually it's something to be shown on pride. And I'm just believing that some of the things that you've experienced, some of the things that you've walked through, that you've had to deal with, it's not going to be things that are going to be hidden and buried. It's actually going to be that God's going to come. He's going to take with that which the enemy caused to harm you, and He's actually going to make it for good, for His glory. For His glory to say, I was broken, but look what God did. I was a mess. I was in pieces, but the God who can heal, who can restore, who can redeem, has put me back together. And now I want to display it and say, look at the glory of God. Look at the grace of God. Look at what He's done. And we display it. We may be pressed, church. We may experience strife and difficulty and brokenness, but we do not have to live broken. Pressed, but not broken. Pressed, but not broken, because God, you can do the impossible. Come on, church, stand to your feet right now. We're going to pray. And I know for some of you, this has been like hard hitting, but I've been praying for you all week and asking the Holy Spirit to prepare your hearts to receive this. And there's only so much I can do. I'm just believing the Holy Spirit's going to come and it's going to do what He does. We're going to spend some time in worship. And don't worry. In fact, there's not even another service, so we don't have to worry about time. I want us to take a moment, believe that this moment right now has the ability to transform generations to come. We're going to walk out of here free. We're going to walk out of here with that sense of God has met me and restored and healed. So if you know you just need God to come and do something, why don't you just raise your hands? We're going to pray. We're going to worship. Maybe you need to choose to forgive. It's going to take every bit of courage in you. You're going to want to fight it because it's been an injustice. But we're going to give it to God and say, God, we let you be judge over that. And as you offer forgiveness, you're going to feel the sense of release that it's had on you, the grip that it's had on you. For some of you, maybe as I've been speaking, you've felt like you've kind of understood some of your relationships that have not worked because of some things that you've not been able to deal with or put to rest. A new sense of peace is going to come. So come on, let's raise our hands. God, I thank you that you are here I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've been illuminating. I ask right now that you would just begin to highlight seeds of brokenness, that you want to redeem, restore, and heal. God, we ask right now in this moment for freedom from everything that's been holding people back, where insecurity has just gripped them. Every decision, every filter, every relationship has been um, dictated to by this insecurity. God, I pray that you would speak to people's 
directly into the core of their being to say that they are valued, that they are chosen, that they are loved and affirmed by you, the Heavenly Father. God, would you come and redeem right now? Restore. Come and heal every bit of brokenness, every bit of hurt and pain, every tear, God, that you know you catch. And God, I'm believing that right now you're going to stoop down for those people that feel like they're in a pit and you're going to reach down and pull them out of deep water. Thank you for what you're about to do. Come on, the band are going to worship. We're going to speak to brokenness and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Thank you, God. Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We'd love for you to join us at one of our campuses, Manchester, Chester, or online every Sunday, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m.